Hi everyone and welcome to A Story of Light, a live stream musical journey in 19 days. Today is day 13. So if you've been following the story so far, thank you so much for coming on this big adventure with me. And uh, if this is your first time tuning in, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Luke Slot. I'm a musician in Dublin and I mainly focus on setting to music the Baha'i sacred writings. And for the first 19 days of March, I'm doing this series of daily live streams for about 15, 20 minutes a day uh, with a bit of storytelling and a song at the end here at AP Studios Dublin. Uh, and this is all in, in, uh, in preparation for the release of my upcoming new album, Home of Light, which is a collection of new songs based on the writings of Abdul Baha. And if you're not familiar with Abdul Baha, he was the son of Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i Faith, and he's really cherished as an example and a role model to Baha'is and friends around the world, and 2021 marks the centenary of his passing, hence the, the new album coming out later this year in his honour. So, as usual, the, uh, the, all the previous episodes are linked below if you want to catch up on them in your own time. Um, they're all on a, a YouTube playlist that, uh, as, you know, as, as we go through the journey, I'm adding them to the playlist, so they'll always be posted. But to pick up our story, uh, yesterday we, we looked at, uh, at Baha'u'llah and the family's arrival in the, the destination of their final exile, the prison city of Akka in the Holy Land, just across the bay from Mount Carmel, where those German Templars were living and waiting in, in expectation of the coming of the Promised One. And we looked at this, this transformation that had taken place in the attitude of the, the people of Akka towards Baha'u'llah and the family, and how this transformation was largely due to their interactions with Abdul Baha, who was uh, who had he, he was he had blossomed into this outstanding young man, and he was now in his twenties, and he was now sh shouldering the the complex responsibilities of uh, ensuring the the well being of his family and all the other exiles uh, that were with them, and he was dealing with the the prison authorities and government officials in the city, and really through Abdul Baha's efforts the hatred uh, that the people had, had had towards Baha'u'llah and his family had been transformed into friendship and love. The people of Akka had really fallen in love with Abdul Baha and, and they had come to see him as the greatest friend that their city ever had. But of course, the decree of the Sultan, Sultan Abdul Aziz, the, that um, uh, the tyrannical ruler of the of the Ottoman Empire, um, condemning Baha'u'llah and his family to perpetual imprisonment was still in place and by law the Baha'is were not allowed to leave the city gates. But with with all these changes that had taken place in the attitude of the people of Akka towards the exiles, Abdul Baha decided that he wanted to test the power of the Sultan's decree. And so one day he woke up and he went about his daily routine, feeding the poor, visiting the sick, um, meeting with government officials and seeing to any matters of the day. And as he moved across the city, he gradually edged closer and closer to the city gate. And on that day, nine years after the family had arrived to the unrestrained hatred of the people, Abdul Baha stood at the city limits of Akka. And he stepped out of the gate. And no one stopped him. Not the army, not the police chief, not the government. No one. Even the, the armed sentinels who stood guard constantly over the, the city gates simply lowered their eyes in respect before the one who they had all come to refer to as the master of Akka. And so Abdul Baha knew that even though Baha'u'llah and the family may have been prisoners on paper, in the eyes of the people of Akka, the Sultan's decree was a dead letter. And so Abdul Baha set out from the city with a new mission on his mind to ease his father's troubles because 
ever since that day, all those years ago, back in Tehran, when, as a child of, of eight years of age, he had fainted at the sight of, of his father, battered, bruised and weighed down by the chains of the black pit. Abdu'l-Bahá had acutely felt the pain of all that his father had, had gone through. He had watched as his uncle, Mirza Yahya, had turned the Babis against Baha'u'llah back in Baghdad and how he had later poisoned him in Adrianople. He had watched how his father had had to deal with th these successive exiles and imprisonments um, and, and uh, the, the re repeated loss of a basic family home. And he longed to see his father live out his days in some degree of peace. And over the years, although Abdu'l-Bahá had obviously never had any opportunity for any kind of formal education, over the years he had, uh, he had learnt uh, a craft of weaving mats. It was a simple craft, but he was very good at it. And, and as the, 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 um, the prison restrictions had eased, Abdu'l-Bahá was able to use this craft of weaving mats to start earning a little bit of money to support himself and the family, and gradually he developed a small business in Akka. And eventually, Abdu'l-Bahá was able to purchase a, a property in the countryside outside of Akka, where Baha'u'llah could, could live in some degree of comfort. And so through the devotion of his son, Baha'u'llah eventually moved out of the prison city to this house in the countryside called Bahji, which means the place of delight. And so the years marched on uh, in Bahji. Baha'u'llah continued to write and send out his, his guidance out into the world. His brother Mirza Yahya uh, had been separated from him by the authorities and had been separately exiled to Cyprus, where he lived out his days unrelenting in his bitterness and hatred of Baha'u'llah and unwilling to make amends, no matter how much Baha'u'llah called out to him for reconciliation. Baha'u'llah's beloved wife, Nawab, who um, for 50 years of marriage had stood by him unflinchingly, finally uh, gained some peace in her final years and passed away in 1886 with Baha'u'llah by her side. And actually, I thought I would share with you a brief description of Nawab. Uh, this comes from The Chosen Highway by Lady Blomfield. So, Antimo, could you put up the, the first slide, please? Nawab, honoured by, Baha by Baha'u'llah with the designation the most exalted leaf, was the embodiment of true nobility. Her deep attachment to the cause of Baha'u'llah was one of her great distinguishing features. She had a compassionate and loving nature. Her faith in Baha'u'llah was resolute and unshakable. And so the 19th century was now entering its final decade. And for nearly 40 years, uh, in the face of the most colossal opposition from really from the superpowers of the world, Baha'u'llah had worked with this boundless energy to deliver to the world this, th th this creative impulse that it needed to spur itself onwards to the next stage of its spiritual and social evolution. And that next stage he had identified as the consciousness of the oneness of mankind. And over those 40 years, really through the means of his successive banishments from one place to another, Baha'u'llah had come into personal contact with thousands, perhaps even tens of thousands of people in, in Persia, in, in Iraq, in, uh, in Turkey, and finally in, in Palestine. But towards the end of his life, it became very clear that his message was reaching far beyond the limits of the lands in which he had lived. And... Uh, about two years before he passed away, a professor from England arrived in the Holy Land 
requesting an interview with Baha'u'llah. His name was Edward Granville Brown, and he was a professor of Oriental Studies at Cambridge University, and he had been following the development of Baha'u'llah's cause for, for, uh, for many years. And Edward Brown left this account of, uh, of his interview with Baha'u'llah. So, Antimo, could you, uh, could you put up the, uh, the next slide, please? Uh, and you could just change it as I, as I read. So. The face of him on whom I gazed, I can never forget, though I cannot describe it. Those piercing eyes seemed to read one's very soul. Power and authority sat on that ample brow while the deep lines on the forehead and face implied an age which the jet-black hair and beard flowing down in indistinguishable luxuriance almost to the waist seemed to belie. No need to ask in whose presence I stood, as I bowed myself before one who is the object of a devotion and love which kings might envy and emperors sigh for in vain. A mild, dignified voice bade me be seated and then continued. Praise be to God that thou hast attained. Thou hast come to see a prisoner and an exile. We desire but the good of the world and the happiness of the nations. Yet they deem us a stirrer up of strife and sedition, worthy of bondage and banishment. That all nations should become one in faith and all men as brothers. That the bonds of affection and unity between the sons of men should be strengthened. What harm is there in this? Yet so it shall be. These fruitless strifes, these ruinous wars shall pass away, and the most great peace shall come. And so as the 19th century was coming to a close, this great sun that had risen up in Persia and had blazed out over Baghdad and Constantinople and Adrianople and finally over the Holy Land began its descent to the horizon. And in the springtime of 1892, Baha'u'llah contracted a mild fever and retired to his bed in Bahji. And on May 28th, 1892, in that country acclaimed for thousands of years as the nest of the prophets, he quietly slipped out of this world and was gone. And the following morning, a telegraph was sent to Sultan Abdul Aziz, that, that all-powerful ruler who had witnessed his own impotence in trying to suppress the message of Baha'u'llah, to inform him that his prisoner had passed away. And that telegraph began with a simple but weighty statement that all it said was, The son of Baha has set. And so to bring today's uh, chapter to a close, I thought I would share with you this, uh, this beautiful passage that I came across, which was written several years later by the world's first Baha'i queen, Queen Marie of Romania. And uh, I just thought that this, this uh, passage written by the Queen of Romania would act as a, as a, as a fitting kind of bookend to this, uh, this chapter in our story. So Antimo, could you put up the next, uh, the next couple of slides, please? Thanks. At first, we all conceive of God as something or somebody apart from ourselves. We think he is something or somebody definite outside of us, whose quality, meaning, and so to say, personality, we can grasp with our human, finite minds and express in mere words. This is not so. We cannot, with our earthly faculties, entirely grasp his meaning no more than we can really understand the meaning of eternity. God is certainly not the old fatherly gentleman with the long beard that in our childhood we saw pictured sitting amongst the clouds on the throne of judgment, holding the lightning of vengeance in his hand. God is something simpler, happier, and yet infinitely more tremendous. God is all, everything. He is the power behind all beginnings, he is the inexhaustible source of supply, of love, of good, of progress, of achievement. God is therefore happiness. 
His is the voice within us that shows us good and evil. But mostly we ignore or misunderstand this voice. Therefore did he choose his elect to come down amongst us upon earth to make clear his word, his real meaning. Therefore the prophets, therefore Christ, Muhammad, Baha'u'llah. For man needs from time to time a voice upon earth to bring God to him, to sharpen the realization of the existence of the true God. Those voices sent to us had to become flesh, so that with our earthly ears we should be able to hear and understand. And so, of course, today is only day 13 of our journey and it, the passing of Baha'u'llah is far from the end of our story. And in fact, uh, this moment actually marks the beginning of a, of a whole new chapter in our story, a chapter for which throughout his entire life as a father, Baha'u'llah had been preparing everyone around him. And so in tomorrow's episode, we're going to open up that new chapter. So... Uh, if you, so today I'm going to sing for you some uh, some words of Baha'u'llah, which I've chosen, which I think are uh, a, a fitting choice for this moment in the story. Um, and if you're fasting today, I wish you a really good fast, and I hope you'll join me tomorrow for day uh, 14 of the of a story of light. This piece is called Dominion. O Son of Man, Thou art my dominion, and my Thou thy perishing, thou art my light, and my light shall never be extinct. Why dost thou dread extinction? Thou art my glory, and my glory. Of glory